Hi. Hi everyone. See people are joining in. <laughs> Hi Stacy. Okay, volume increased. How's everyone doing? Hi Tanil. Yay, so that was quick. <laughs> Hi everyone. So literally a minute early, I had to make sure that, you know, I'm on time and have everything working. You know how technology can get, right? <laughs> My name is Bozo, aka Fitness Mpanda. Fitness because I love fitness and Mpanda because my surname is very long, Mpanda Wana. So... Just shortened it, you know, in Panda. I am so ready for this live. I hope you guys are. I'm excited because as a first time mom, well, yeah, a year ago, <laughs> I was, I didn't know a lot. Like, honestly, you read, but yeah. Oh, there's Donna. There is Donna. Awesome. Let me invite Donna. Donna, you can request, request to join the live, and then I will accept it to this side. Yay. So yeah, as I was saying, you know, as a first time mom, um, I didn't know certain things, and reading obviously helped, so I'm looking forward to this, especially for our first time moms, you know, to... To help them, help them with the journey. So I'm just waiting for Donna. I don't know if she's requested as yet, requested to join the live. And then we get started. Okay, there's something coming up. There you go. Sorry for the silence. <laughs> I don't know if her request came through. I saw a little tick there. So let me do this. you please accept my invite then we get started hello <laughs> hi Donna. sorry about this it's okay we're here at last we're here at last welcome to thank Mama you <laughs> thanks so much my name is Bozo fitness and panda and i'm a mom you know, to everyone, welcome once again. I'm a mom of one cute little baby girl, a year, four months, yeah. And it's been a, it's been a good journey. But so today we're going to talk about caring for your newborn. Donna, please may you introduce yourself to the followers and everyone else watching. Yes, sure. Um, hi, I'm Donna Bland. I'm married with three wonderful sons, ranging between 17 and 26. I also have two amazing grandchildren, a little boy, Asha, who's three, and a new little granddaughter that'll be two months tomorrow, Tegan oh. Rose. Yes, so we're very excited. New, new addition to our family. Beautiful. She's absolutely gorgeous, thriving beautifully. So I've been... Um, I beg your yep. pardon? No, you were going to say? No, I'm saying two months. That's absolutely cute. Yeah, no, she's gorgeous. <laughs> Growing rapidly, unfortunately, but yes. Um, I've been a doula for 18 yeah. years now in private practice. 
And um, for those moms who don't mm -hmm. know what a doula's function is, unlike a midwife who actually catches the baby and is involved in the medical care as mom, we're involved more from an emotional and um, in terms of pain management and things like that. So that's really where we get involved. It's yeah. a very crucial yeah. role. It doesn't take the place of dad's role. It's more there to enhance his role and if anything to help him because these poor dads are like um, deer in the headlights when, you know, when they go to the birth. And so we often land up being their very best friend. Um, and I'm also studying craniosacral yeah. therapy yeah. at the moment. So I was hoping to be finished with that at the end of the year, but good old COVID-19 has put a stop to a lot of stuff. So hopefully within the next nine months, I'll be qualified as a craniosacral therapist as well. So I'll be able to help moms and babies in that regard as well. So, yeah, just wonderful work. I'm very passionate about what I do, and I'm very privileged to do what I do. I've done a lot of educating, childbirth educating for parents, and obviously postnatal care as well. I'm actually glad you mentioned that up, you know, what a doula does, because mm. there's a bit, there was a bit of confusion, you know, as to say, is that similar to a midwife or not? No. And, you know, or once I have the baby and I come home, you know, I'm still, should I still have a doula there? So in terms of when I bring the baby home, you know, um, I will dive right in into the questions. Um, bathing baby, you know, yes. this one's a big one. Them bath my newborn at the hospital or not? Should we wait just a day for the skin to dry up a little bit? What's the recommended procedure there? Well, first of all, to say that your doula will do postnatal visits with you if you do choose to have one, but you okay. can also employ a doula just for postnatal use. So, in other words, you don't have to have her at your birth if you choose not to. You can actually have someone help you um, or assist you at home. Um, but to remember that, um, you know, we are now following newer trends. We're learning more as research, evidence-based research comes in and so on. And what we've actually found is that it is more beneficial to wait to give your baby its first bath, preferably until you get home, actually. But we try and do two days if possible. Three days is great. Some people wait as long as a week. There isn't a wrong way of doing it in that in that respect. And a lot of moms might think, oh, that's gross. You know, um, surely the baby will be dirty. Well, they're not really doing anything to get dirty. And when they're born, you know, we wipe them down significantly so that anything that's on their skin and that, any blood or anything like that can be wiped off. Um, if they have a little bit in their hair, if they've got quite a lot of hair, and there's yeah. a bit of blood or something yeah. like that in there here. What we can do if, if it bothers mom is we can actually just take a, um, a face cloth or some um, um, cotton wool with some warm water and just wipe it down. But to be honest with you, within the first 48 hours at least, we do prefer a baby, even in summer, to be wearing a beanie. And the reason for that is because they lose their heat from their heads initially. And they don't have any uh, temperature gauge at the beginning of life especially within the first 48 hours. And what we find with bathing too early, besides the fact, well, there's a couple of reasons. First yeah. of all, when a yeah. mom delivers her baby, her baby is full of, if she's had a normal vaginal delivery, then her, body's, her baby's body is full of her microbiome, which is all the bacteria that um, comes through the birth canal. It's good bacteria. We always think of bacteria as bad, but it's, we do have good bacteria and bad bacteria. So this bacteria is important because what we want to do is we want to get it into the baby's gut, into their little tummies to colonize there in the early days so that the baby actually has um, a very good basis for starting life. Okay. Even if a mom has a Caesar, um, the baby is born with, and depending on how early or late they are, but the baby is born with vernix. Now, vernix is that white, waxy substance yeah. that's on the baby yeah. when they're born. Yeah. It's like a very good, uh, it's the best um, uh, aqueous cream you'll ever come across. It's fantastic. <laughs> but what it actually does is it helps um, the skin moisturize, but it, within about 24 hours it absorbs into the skin anyway. So there's really no reason to wash it off. And it's full of vitamin K, which your baby generally is given a vitamin K um, injection anyway uh, within an hour or two after birth. Yeah. But um, vitamin K is for blood clotting. So we're trying yeah. to prevent brain clots and things like that, or hemorrhages rather. So um, 
So we're wanting to make sure that the clotting factors are good. And leaving that on is just giving the baby that extra boost, mm. you know, of the okay. But as I say, within 24 hours, it's fully absorbed into the skin. So there's absolutely no reason um, to get rid of it. Okay. You know, in terms of the, the temperature, I was talking yes. about baby losing its temperature. That's yes. the third thing. Yes. But with bathing too early, the baby's temperature can be dropped. And that can actually be problematic for the baby in its early stages. Okay. So we don't want to decrease baby's temperature because that can be obviously dangerous to baby. So if they're not um, actually bathed early, it helps them regulate their temperature. Okay, that makes sense because I was, I was really confused and I was like, should we bath baby at? Because I think I bath my baby probably I think a day a day after giving birth. But I was mm. like, should should she be sleeping with all of that? <laughs> There's like, absolutely no harm in it. Mm. At home and eventually now, be it that you took twenty four hours, forty eight hours, you need to bath baby. So I I had my mother-in-law helping me and my mom at home, but I, I will tell the honest truth here. I didn't bath my baby for the first two, three weeks, if not longer, because I was scared. I was like, I'm not mm. sure how to hold this little baby. Do we put, the, put her in the tub or do we just wipe her down? What tips can you give us for you know, bathing new, a, a newborn? Yes, it can be very daunting because they little they slippery little suckers when they're full of soap. <laughs> so they're quite scary. And you want to use all these products that you got, you know, you, you got these new products to wash baby with this scent or just the a normal aqueous cream. So you're not too sure as well what to use. So yeah, just never right. forget that please. Okay, sure. Well, first of all, um Adula again will do your first bath with you if you want to employ a doula for that. Yeah. Um, if you've got somebody who knows what they're doing, that's great. There are products that you can buy to put in the bath. There's these uh, pillow type things that are filled with little beans that can help, yeah. like a flotation device that can give moms and dads more confidence. But obviously you can't use that long term. So yeah. I think it's a good idea to learn the skill of bathing your baby. Um, yeah. A lot of yeah. them like to bath with their baby. So they get in the bath with baby and then mom just – Gives them the baby, takes the baby out, and then dresses baby. That's a oh, nice way for them to bond. <laughs> but they might be scared. So it depends on the dad. Yeah. Um, but in terms of products and that sort of thing, I would say keep it as simple as possible. Try and use very natural products. And if you haven't got very natural products, organic type products, I would just stick to things like you say, and a, a simple um, aqueous cream. We find, you know, when you go onto these Facebook groups and that you often see moms complaining about their babies having skin irritations early on. Yes. And I often think that a lot of it is to do with the perfumes and the preservatives and that that are in all these products. So if we keep it simple and keep it as um, neutral as possible. I think we can prevent introducing all that to the baby's skin. Um, so that can be very helpful. Um, I can't remember what else did you ask about bathing. <laughs> I do have a question here. About, okay. Um, if you're in hospital, do the nurses not help you teach how to bath baby and wrap them in the spreadle? Um, you know what, um, Kirsta, they taught us, but for me, I was still very scared. So that's why Daddy did yeah. all that. Yeah. But yeah. you to elaborate on that one a bit. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's wonderful for somebody to demonstrate it. It's a whole different thing, as you said, to actually do it yourself. Mm. So it's, it's better if you can be doing it and having somebody at home who can guide you through it. If they're willing to let you bath the baby and they will just stand there and actually assist you um, if you need it, then that's great. But still, I would leave it for the day that you are um, discharged from hospital because then you've given your baby two or three days um, mm -hmm. not bathing. So rather leave it till the end of the hospital stay. Where the swaddling and that is concerned, we'll come back to swaddling. I'm sure you're going to ask about that later. Yeah. But when <laughs> just quickly just to mention about the swaddling with that lady's question is that, um, yes, they can show you that, but they can show you that regardless of whether the baby's bathed or not. Okay. So, you know, I wouldn't worry about that. That they will teach you regardless. All right. And then now with baby massage, do, you do it straight after bath? Once you started bathing baby 
or do you leave it later it later on when baby's about 3 or 4 weeks when do you start with baby massage I think it's important to start early I think the earlier you start the better the baby gets used to it mm-hmm. it certainly helps it improves digestion and aids with digestion mm-hmm. it helps baby settle better so they cry less they fuss less um yeah. it also yeah. helps them um physically socially uh, mentally it just it calms them so they they're a lot more equipped to deal with their sensory world you know the problem with babies is that they're very bombarded with a lot of sensory input on a yeah. daily basis because yeah. remember we have five senses mm-hmm. and they're taking all those different senses in and it can be very overwhelming for their little systems because they're very immature mm-hmm. so the mom's massage I mean dad can get involved too there's no harm in that but mom's the father especially because there is this connection between mom and baby um it really creates a wonderful way of the baby feeling completely calm and relaxed to such an extent that they actually have found that it improves uh, the baby's immunity um so its immunity improves um they they stay more relaxed as i said it, it, and it also helps with weight gain so if you're finding that your baby's weight is not doing so well obviously you need to look at the feeding that could be an issue but besides that it could just be that the baby has digestive issues or that you've got a fussy baby and massaging that baby is going to create a calmer baby that can actually cope better so baby massage is a wonderful thing to do and you know there's so many uh, videos and things like that that you can download to watch how to do it or you can go to a a class where they teach you some moms like to be in a group so that yeah. they actually yeah. are interacting with other mommies as well and this that's absolutely perfect it's a little bit difficult now with covid obviously yeah. but um besides that as a norm um moms quite enjoy the groups but otherwise you can just do it at home in terms of when in the day to do it it depends when you're bathing your baby okay. obviously you want the baby to be warm and because we're still in winter i know that we getting a little warmer but yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> i would rather recommend doing it in the day and doing it in a sunny area okay. so you want okay. like inside where maybe a window where there's some sun shining in and you mm-hmm. can because you basically want your baby naked so i'd put the baby on the changing mat have something that um is either waterproof or the, maybe the changing mat is waterproof or something that you don't mind if the baby wheezes or something yes. and then <laughs> cuz you're going to do both sides Mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and just have a face cloth or something handy if it's a boy because boys tend to wee everywhere especially if they lie on their backs <laughs> so just be prepared for that girls are a little <clears throat> you know less problematic where that's concerned yeah but um, certainly i would keep it when it's a, a warmer time of the day so that because otherwise baby's going to be agitated and you don't want them to be agitated and obviously make sure your hands are warm don't go to them with cold hands for things Yeah. Oh, so I'm going to get a bit front. With with my little baby um I have a bit of and I didn't get a lot of massage or you know techniques to to help her with that. You know, yes. and now when you're massaging especially in the tummy area I know, I know a lot of moms go through that with the newborns where baby struggling with a bit of gas, you know, what's the right um or can you recommend the right way to just massage that area to help release a bit of gas. Okay, so there's a couple of things that they can do. Mm-hmm. First of all, what I like to do is I like to play with the legs. So with mm-hmm. the baby lying on its back, yes. you actually hold the baby. If I can just show you with my little doll, they're yes. going to hold the baby behind the knee. Okay? Yes. So gently behind the knees, all right? And you want to wait and just sort of shake the baby's legs gently so that they'll loosen them because you know they stiffen up. Yes. So just loosen And then what you do is you can actually do little bicycle movements, okay? This way and up and down. Yeah. And they can also yeah. do circular bicycle movements. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then um that can be very helpful, all right? And also pushing up towards the tummy and kind of pushing it against the tummy. Often they uh, they they let a little bit of wind out as mommy's doing that. I found that with some of my babies and it's very helpful. Yeah. So so that's yeah. it. Right? Do you do it for how long? Maybe two two three times a day or just once? No, you can do it as often as you like, but obviously you want baby to be awake because you don't want to disturb their sleep. Yes. Um so uh, just before a feed off, they're very fussy and very hungry. 
Mm. Wait a little bit after they feed and do it. But be careful not to shake them too much because obviously then it might come out the other way. Other way. <laughs> You've got to be careful of that. But um, and the other thing you can do is you take your thumbs. Now, again, trying to use my doll. At the bottom here, can you see my doll over here all right? So just above the legs, okay, yeah. there's a little patch there on the tummy, right low down. Okay. So what mom needs to do is take her thumbs and just rub very gently upwards on that area, okay? That's a very nice way as well. Not applying too much pressure, just a little bit. Yes. And then the other thing is to actually do a nice little tummy rub. Now, our colons run in a clockwise direction. Yes. So you must always rub in the clockwise direction. We never rub against the direction of digestion. Yeah. Okay, so clockwise. Yeah. Awesome. So that's a couple awesome. of things that they can do, and that can really be very helpful. But if a baby's really struggling, one of the things that really helps is keeping them upright. So trying to keep them over your shoulder. Yeah. You know, really well over the shoulder, letting the baby's head almost be over your shoulder. That mm -hmm. really helps as well, you know, um, because you're opening up that diaphragm so yeah. that baby can, um, can digest that food well. But, you know, the sad thing is that there's so much, um, there's so many myths around colic. Mm -hmm. uh, colic is a lot more rare than moms are aware of. And all babies in the first six to eight weeks of life, have some form of digestive um, issue or, you know, like just disturbance, basically. And it's yeah. quite normal. Yeah. So moms mustn't get frantic and think, oh, I need colic drops of some sort and all that. No, that's the worst thing you can do. If you're breastfeeding, your baby's getting exactly what it needs. If you're bottle feeding, you can possibly introduce a probiotic, a pre and probiotic if you want to. That can be helpful. Because obviously, then your baby's not getting that naturally from the breast milk. So that would be for your formula fed babies. But yeah, if a mom is yeah. breastfeeding, there's absolutely no need for anything else because it's human milk. So we're giving the baby exactly what our bodies are producing for our human babies. Okay. That's why uh, formula-fed babies tend to have more issues because they're drinking cows or goats or whatever type of milk. And that milk hasn't got the same um, uh, makeup in proteins and sugars and so on as our own breast milk does. So no, we, no. Have, we have another question here. It says, can you share a bit, of, a bit more tips on how to wind the baby? especially even after burping, you know, a newborn, it, it's so tricky because it can be a tiny little thing. My baby was 2.89 and, you know, she was like this little thing, how to burp, you know, and release the wind. Yeah, I know. When they're little like that, it's very daunting because you feel like you're going to break them. Well, the most important thing to remember is there's absolutely no need to pat a baby. You don't need to be knocking them. Okay, yes. so we're not doing this... You know, that's what they used to do in the old days, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might see grannies and aunties doing that, all right? But it's it's not necessary because so what I'm actually happens... So, mommy, hint, mommy. hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> you know, speak to the moms, the older moms. Um, but I must be honest, I mean, I've got grandchildren and I remember doing it to my boys, you know, because, I mean, my oldest was 26. So that's what we were taught, you know. But yeah. actually what it does is... It all it does is it breaks down the bubble of air into a whole lot of smaller bubbles, which mm -hmm. can be helpful to some extent because smaller bubbles can come up easier. But if there's too many of them, it's still going to be difficult for the baby to burp any, in any case. So first and foremost, try not to pat. What we want to do is we want to do rubbing rather mm -hmm. than patting. Now, as I said earlier, if you're going to do the one where you've got the baby over the shoulder, the most important thing to remember and you see my baby's head is right well over my shoulder. You yes. almost want the baby's head draped over your shoulder. A lot of mommies will put their babies here. And because the baby has been in a fetal position for nine months, or close to nine months, they actually generally are still quite folded over. And mm -hmm. you can win the baby properly without the diaphragm being open. So the reason why we put them well over is so that their little diaphragm area here in the front yeah. is nicely yeah. open. Okay, so they're well over. We use the palm of our hand and we okay. move okay. in an upwards direction. Okay, quite a firm pressure, not hard, but firm enough so that you're making a difference. 
Okay. Now, I can't do it with my doll, unfortunately, because my doll is stiff. I need to get a soft doll. <laughs> but there's a method where you put, I'm going to try and show you, your thumb by the front of the nappy. Okay. And your four fingers on the back of the nappy. Okay. With the baby in the same position. Mm -hmm. And then you wiggle their little hips. So it's oh. quite, a, quite a quick little movement. Yeah. Am I allowed to give reference to somebody that they can go and look, look up? Yes. On the speed. Okay. There is a chiropractor by the name of Dr. Mike Marinas. You owe me, Dr. Marinas. <laughs> and he does, he actually did a video, I think it's about eight years ago almost, that he did a video of burping techniques. It okay. would be much better okay. for the moms to actually go and have a look. So it's Mike Marinas, M-A-R-I-N-U-S. He's a chiropractor here in Johannesburg. And um, he did a wonderful video of a variety of techniques. That, that's one of his techniques. Right. And it worked like a bomb. But one of the ones that I can show you now, and dads like it, is for babies to actually be, can you see a little bit? The yes. baby is draped yeah. over my arm yeah. with the head slightly to the side. Yes. Sorry, I'm trying to get it so that you can see. And you see where my hand is. It's just like holding onto the jawline. Yes. Now, dads love that because they can walk around with their babies like that for ages. And why is that? <laughs> why exactly? Why is that helpful? Because the diaphragm is open again. Okay, so we want an open diaphragm. Otherwise, they're not going to break those wings. But what people have to remember as well, a very important point, is preferably your baby should be awake. Uh, Sleeping babies don't break wings properly. Okay. So you need to wake them. And people will say, yeah, but after I fed, my baby's so sleepy. Yes, they are, okay, because it's comforting. How and do you have to wake though, Donna? You've got to make them a little uncomfortable. Go right back to sleep. You've got to actually get them a little uncomfortable, which is, seems cruel, and a lot of moms think I'm being ugly when I say that. But you have to actually maybe strip them down a little bit. Make sure you're in a warm enough room so that baby's not going to be cold. But um, you can always put a, a loose blanket over baby, but preferably I would do it just in the nappy if you have to, if your baby's very sleepy. Your babies who have had um, jaundice and things like that, they're a little bit more difficult because those babies are sleepy anyway, okay? But, um, you know, only if your baby's displaying, like, signs of struggling with wind do you really have to be terribly concerned. But what Dr. Marinas will tell, will tell moms in that video as well is that burping can take up to 20 minutes. People will try for less than five and say, I can't do this. My baby can't break winds. What I do find is that often, and I know that dads are not always awake in the middle of the night, but what I do find is that um, if the mom is struggling, and also dads tend to break the winds. I don't know why, but they seem to be masters at it. So let dad do it. You know, okay. as okay. often as possible. Donna, we have enough questions. Yes, we have quite a few. So let's try Wonderful. to get them. There's one here that says, do you recommend delayed umbilical cord clamping? 100% yes. Yes. The reason, yes. The reason for that is, well, there's a few reasons. Okay. First of all, when a baby's cord is left unclamped for the first minute or two, the baby is receiving all the blood that is remaining in the placenta. Remember when the baby's first born, the placenta is still within the mom's body. Okay. So it's still living in a sense. And what they found now through research is that the baby can receive as much as two thirds more blood volume. If the umbilical cord is left to pulsate, well, left until it to be clamped until it stopped pulsating. Oh, okay. so it's iron stores it's stem cells so a lot of people do stem cell banking and if you choose to do that then they can't do delayed cord clamping that's understood and that's your prerogative as a mom if you want to do that mm -hmm. but if you choose not to do that the benefits of leaving the, uh, the umbilical cord um, unclamped until it stops pulsating is because those stem cells are actually getting into your baby's body so your baby's receiving those stem cells that we've treasured so much. Okay. So why on earth would you want to clamp that? Uh, now, the difficult thing in our country is we have an incredibly high cesarean rate. Yes. And moms will be very hard-pressed to find gynees that are open to leaving the, the, the umbilical cord to stop 
pulsating before they clamp it and cut it because it's a sterile environment. And now with COVID, it's very much more difficult. Exactly. Um, I would recommend that moms educate themselves properly okay. on, on these type of things and that they address it with their gynees early, if they were the gynae. Um, but midwife-led care is my preference, but if a mom chooses to go with a gynae, my advice would be to go to the gynae with her list of things that she would like to have on the day of delivery and say, these are things I've researched and I believe are going to be good for my baby. Would you be willing to allow me to have these things incorporated into my birth plan because a birth plan is very important for a mom it so is. that these type of things can be adhered to. Yeah. But if the doctor doesn't know, you know, he's not on the day, he's just going to say no. Um, and then still keeping on to the biblical cord, there's a question here that says, so how do you take care of it? And what products can you use for for medical cord care, yeah. Okay, there's a couple of things moms can do. First of all, anywhere except for South Africa, they actually tell you not to bath until the stump has fallen off. Mm. Now, in South Africa, we don't mind bathing because it dries very quickly afterwards. Um, but as I said earlier in the in the interview, we, we obviously do promote delayed bathing. But um, in terms of the care of the cord, first of all, the cord should be uh, cleaned every nappy change and every bath time. Okay, mm. the more the moms do it, the quicker the cord will actually fall off and the quicker it will heal. Now, it's not painful. And so when moms clean it, the babies often cry. They're crying because it's cold and uncomfortable. I don't want somebody sticking their finger in my belly button. It's uncomfortable, <laughs> you know, so they are going to be agitated. Once again, thank you, Austin. He, he did most of that cleaning. <laughs> yes, yes. Sometimes the dads are better at it because they don't, they don't get so, you know, stressed as we do. Yeah. So there's a couple of things moms can use. First of all, if you're breastfeeding, breast milk is fantastic. It can be used for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, cleaning the cord is one of them. So she can hand express a little bit of breast milk and use that with either a cotton, a piece of cotton wool or a, a cotton bud and earbud. Or yeah. she can use sur surgical spirits, which is the most commonly used product. Yes. Um, or the Walida makes a product called Graze and Wound Powder. Mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful one because if a mom is frightened of touching the area and having to work with, because it gets a bit gunky after a few days if you're not cleaning it thoroughly, um, if she's a bit afraid to go near there with that, then my recommendation would be getting the powder because all you do is you lift the stump, put the powder on, be careful. Obviously, the baby doesn't go anywhere near baby's face. You don't want baby inhaling the powder, but yes. just gently, yeah. you know, put that on and then you just leave it. And moms must always make sure that the umbilical cord is outside of the nappy. The beauty of a lot of our disposable nappies today is that they have a little scoop to leave yes. space for the umbilical cord. Okay. So they need to make sure that that umbilical cord, it's got the clamp attached still very often when they leave the hospital. They need to just make sure that's outside the nappy so that it's, there's no irritation because if it pulls, it could hurt the baby. Yeah. You know, right. so that, that she's got to be careful of. Talking about nappies. Poo time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the, yeah, the, the, the poo that comes out, the color, you know, as a first time mom, you're like, is this normal? Should this poo be this color? Is it green? <laughs> Can you please take us through that? You know, the type of poo to, to, to expect. Um, to expect, you mm. know, for a newborn. And let's say, you know, it's the green poo for how long? And even nappies, how many nappies should I be expecting to change, you know, when um, in that newborn phase? Okay. So the very first um, stool that a baby will pass is called meconium. Okay. And a meconium is there because while the baby's in utero, they're swallowing, continually swallowing amniotic fluid. And that is their, one of their food sources. All right. So they swallow and the, and, the, and the fluid gets filtered because they urinate it out and then they swallow some more and so on and so forth. And But when they're first born, the first milk that's available to baby is called colostrum. Now, yes. colostrum has incredible laxative product, uh, properties. And that milk actually helps that meconium come through. But regardless of how mom chooses to feed her baby, that baby has got to get rid of that meconium. Okay? okay. So it is, like you say, it's thick. It's tarish. It's so dark green, it almost looks black. 
Um, and it's yeah. very difficult to clean. Thank goodness today these nice wet wipes because when I had my first two boys, we used cotton wool and warm water and it was oh, it was incredibly difficult to get off. Um, but that'll only last as long as the colostrum is, um, you know, available in mom's breasts. And that's usually anything between two and eight days. That's sort of our window. But usually three to four days, we normally start to see that mom's um, mature milk is coming in. And also with that, the stool will actually change to be a different color. So that meconium is, is short-lived. I'd say three to four days is generally what we look at there. Then the baby, the baby system starts to actually show signs of now more nutritive milk. I'm not more nutritive, but more volume milk going in. Okay. Um, and with that comes a different stool, the poo changes. Okay. So that's that sticky, very green, dark green poo. Then it's going to change to sort of a mustardy, yellow, greeny thing that looks very alien. <laughs> and of course, remember they're on a liquid diet, so it's going to be very liquid in consistency. But if a mom is breastfeeding, often what she'll find is she'll see little, what look like sesame seeds in it. And that can freak moms out. They're like, my goodness, my child's not eating seeds. Why on earth does it have seeds in it? But that's a sign. <laughs> that's a sign. It's a good sign for us that yeah, the baby yeah. is getting the fats from the breast milk that mm -hmm. it needs. So in other words, the mom is feeding in a way that is actually being good to the baby's digestive system. Okay. And, okay. In, in, and then it can change again afterwards. Remember also if a baby is breastfed, the, the poos are generally not very um, smelly. Mm -hmm. They'll have a little bit of an odor, but a formula feed baby is... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Did you find it smelly? Yeah, no, this, when we started solid, the poo changed. And then, oh, when we start solid. Well, yeah, no, then that's just another ball game. <laughs> yeah, that's awful. <laughs> uh, and then, so in terms of how many nappies moms can expect to use, yes. we generally, in, uh, we like moms because the urine is obviously also important. The amount of wet nappies we have is also very important because it shows us that the, the baby's kidneys are working correctly. Mm. So we want a baby's kidneys to be working at least, uh, we want five wet nappies a day. That's what we're kind of looking at as, as best case scenario. Now, in terms of how many poos mom can expect, um, look, with breastfeeding, it's a very different story to formula feeding. Formula yeah. feeding you might find once a day or once every couple of days because remember it's dehydrated milk and it's cows or goats milk. It's not human milk. So it's going to have a different effect on the baby's tummy. But if a mom is breastfeeding, she can expect anything from a, a, a dirty nappy, every nappy change to once a week and none of the, anything in between and none of them are wrong because remember that milk is specifically designed for that baby's body. So it will actually, um, just give off what it needs to. Maybe it needs to keep some of that stuff back. And that's why the baby's not pooing as much as the mom would expect. So she mustn't be concerned about constipation. She, she should rather speak to um, a lactation uh, consultant or to um, uh, her clinic sister or someone like that who can advise her. Because very often moms will want to put their babies onto um, medicine for constipation. And it's absolutely not necessary if, she, if baby's being exclusively breastfed. So it's actually, a little bit of a difficult answer with, in terms of breastfeeding. There's actually a question here about breastfeeding and mm. you want, but, you know, how do you know that, you know, my baby is full? Actually, the question says, what to do if newborn is not getting full from breast milk? Mm. Yeah. Feeding, <laughs> feeding is a very big subject. But I will try to help this mom as best I can. <laughs> I'll put it, yeah, I'll put it into a little package. Okay, yeah. so if a mom is breastfeeding, I'm, did she say she's breastfeeding? Well, yes, I, after well, breastfeeding. I assume so, yeah. She says okay. baby's not getting full from breast milk. Okay. That could be a couple of reasons. Um, we have to look at the baby's um, anatomy in terms of the, the, the anatomically in the mouth. Okay. So does that baby have a lip tie or a tongue tie? Um, in other words, is there something hindering that baby from latching onto that breast properly? Or maybe there isn't and the baby just isn't latching correctly. Mm. Um, if your, are your nipples sore? Are they bleeding? Are they cracked? Because that's a sign of um, an incorrect latch. 
Mm. All these type of things can affect it. And you might think, well, what on earth does that have to do with a baby being full? It has a lot to do with it. Because if a baby cannot latch correctly onto the breast, the transfer of milk from the breast to the baby cannot be as effective as if all that was correct and how it should be. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so that we have to look at, is all that in place? All right. If that's in place, baby's drinking nicely. Remember, the only way we can know if a baby, especially after the, um, the colostrum is gone and your volume is increasing, the only way we can know if baby's drinking effectively is by the swallowing sounds. Okay, so we're listening for baby swallowing. And that's how we know that baby's actually transferring milk nicely from the breast. Yeah. Um, yeah. She, then she'd have to look at how long has she got the baby at the breast? Is the baby at the breast long enough? Um, not that a baby needs to be at the breast for an hour. I'm not saying that. What we talk about is active breastfeeding. So when I say talk about active or active drinking, what I mean is how much swallowing is going on. How long is your baby sleeping at the breast? Because we know that they fall asleep at the breast. You know, they drink, 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 and have a little snooze and drink, 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 and fall asleep again. And that's fun. It's normal. It's actually part of breastfeeding. But we need to know that we cannot say, well, I had my baby on the breast for an hour, but only 10 minutes of that was taken up feeding. Because maybe then that's why the baby's not satisfied. Yeah. Then you've got yeah. to make it be a little uncomfortable so that they're awake enough and alert enough to be able to keep transferring milk. So that's very often a cause of um, babies not being satisfied. We also encourage moms to offer babies both breasts. So not just one breast, but to feed off one. When the baby seems satisfied on that side, do winding, changing a nappy, whatever's necessary, and then offer the other side. Even if the baby doesn't do a full feed on the other breast. Yeah. So, you know, in other words, they um, the breasts are actually getting enough stimulation to know how much milk to make. But also, more importantly, the baby is, has the opportunity to get that much more volume in. Okay. If she's having issues with latching or anything like that, and or regardless of what she tries at the, at the breast, it's not working, I would still not recommend topping up with formula. Okay. What I would okay. suggest is that she'd rather do a little bit of expressing and give that baby that milk through a syringe, through a little cup, Something like that. Preferably not a bottle in the first six weeks. Okay. Bottles okay. Call, we call you nipple confusion. I yeah. wanted to ask, when do you start giving baby bottle? You know, especially for moms that will go back to work. I remember with myself, I, I felt like I started late because I started the third month because I, because I had a month till I went back to work. I was at home yeah. for four months. I didn't want the bottle. And I had to... Yeah, I have, you know, do a little tricks, get out of the room, you know, and I changed the, um, the, um, the teat. Actually, what then she then took was, um, was a latex teat instead, yes. or the silicone yes. one. And I suppose because it's a yes. stuff, but I was thinking, yes. what is a recommended time frame to start with the bottle? But Donna, we are almost running out of time, and I've got so many <laughs> questions. I know. A quick one. Hmm. Just to um, quickly, there are two questions here about... Um, dressing up baby, you know, now when it's, it's becoming warmer. One question here says, how do you dress up a newborn in summer? And then we have another mom who says, I'm due in August. And also it's a bit warmer in August. You know, how many layers should I dress up my newborn in? Right. Okay, so let's address the first one. In summer, remember I said in the first 48 hours, babies don't have a way of actually uh, regulating their own temperature. So we always recommend that moms take a vest, a baby grow, socks, and a beanie to hospital. And then plus blankets and so on. Okay, so regardless of whether it's summer or winter, that baby doesn't have a way of keeping themselves warm. Your alternative is to do skin-to-skin -skin care. Now, I know we don't have time to go into that today, but skin-to-skin yeah. -skin care is vitally important. And the mother, the mother and the mother alone has the ability to change her body temperature to what the baby needs. So that can be very helpful. But in terms of dressing, in the first 48 hours, that's what I would recommend. Once baby's home, you can judge for yourself. You know, what we generally say is whatever you're wearing, try and put one more layer on. Uh, okay. okay, that's a good, a good way of gauging. If your baby's perspiring or sweating and um, looking very flushed or very agitated, 
then take a layer off. You know, you can play around. But one thing I must say is don't be encouraged to use your, the baby's extremities as a, as a way of um, judging their temperature. In other words, the hands and the feet. They're bad yeah, judges yeah. because they'll always be cold. Baby's feet and hands generally are cold. Okay. Yeah. The big thing to do is under the neck, under the knee, here in the, you know, in the crook of the arm by the elbow, anywhere like that, that's a better gauge of temperature than, um, than their hands and feet. All right. Yeah, um, and then and what was the second question? Sorry, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Did they answer it? Even in August, it's a bit warmer, and as you said, it you is. Just dress them up with an extra layer compared to what you're wearing. Yeah. So that's very yeah. helpful. Um, quickly, um, I don't know if you can swaddling. You know, this is a big thing yes. now. And seeing, you know, different, um, you know, uh, companies, brands coming up with, you know, materials. Swaddling club. Mm. Me, I, my baby, you know, my husband was good at it, but we found like she didn't like it. That she just wanted to kick, kick herself out of the, you know, the swaddle. Mm. So how do we do it? One, and how long do you swaddle for? You know, in that newborn phase. Oh, look, as long as long as you like, basically. I mean, my sister had twins, and we swaddled them for gosh, I think about six months when they went to sleep because it was one way to keep them calm and, and, and to go to sleep better. It depends on the children, you know, on the actual babies. But to be honest with you, swaddling, people often say to me, most people will say to me, my baby hates being swaddled. The reason for that generally is because they're not being swaddled correctly. And it's not this mom's or anything. All I'm saying is that what do we normally do? We put the baby into like a straight jacket position. So the hands are down by the sides. Am I right? And we yeah. swaddle them. Yeah. I don't want to be wrapped in a blanket like that. It's going to be very uncomfortable. Our midline, which is formed very early um, in, in utero, uh, which becomes in our spine, is we call that our midline. It's the center of our body. Okay. That is a, a, a way in which babies can calm themselves is by bringing their hands to their midline. That's why they often have their hands in their mouth, by their face, all that type of thing. So what we want to do when you're swaddling them is to keep their hands near their face. So even if their little hands escape, we're more concerned about the elbows being kicked down than the hands being restricted. And the reason for that is when they're born, they have that borrow reflex, you know, where they get a fright and their arms go out. I don't know if you could see what I was doing yeah. properly. Um, and that wakes them up when they're sleeping. Mm. So if you can keep the little elbows contained, it prevents that even if they try and do it, they can't. And okay. it just keeps okay. them more secure. The idea behind swaddling is really to mimic the womb. Remember they've been in a tight environment exactly. probably exactly. for three months they've been pretty tight. Okay. And so you can't really say a baby doesn't like being swaddled because that's what they're used to. But the method of swaddling, swaddling is what's important. And, and okay. another thing to remember okay. is that swaddling actually, uh, babies, it, often a mom frets around feeding time because the hands are everywhere. Swaddling can prevent that, can make the baby calmer so that she can put the baby to the breast easier. So there's a lot of benefits behind swaddling. It's just really looking at what's best. There's a fantastic book called Baby Sense. It's been around for quite a few years now. Um, and it's written by Megan Fora and sister Anne Richardson. And it's all about your baby's sensory world. They've written more books since, but that is the first book they wrote. And I would highly recommend that every mom has a copy of that because they all speak right. about all what right. and why it's important and how to do it. Next okay. question. Next question. <laughs> Weighing baby, it's a six-week mm. mark. Should I weigh baby at home or should I take baby to, you know, mm. the, the, the pediatrician? Where should I weigh? Can I weigh baby at home? It's a little bit difficult to weigh your baby at home because obviously moms don't have their correct equipment generally. Um, and what a lot of people will do is they'll get on the scale by themselves and then hold the baby and get back on the scale. It'll give you an idea, but it's certainly not going to be terribly accurate unless you've got a really fancy scale. Um, but yes, we do recommend um, uh, weighing as, as often as possible. In the right circumstances, we do like babies to be weighed at least once every two weeks, if not every week. The reason for that is it's, it's the one way we can make sure that baby's thriving. But otherwise, people just have to be mindful. How do their babies look? Do they look like they're like, does it look like their little faces are filling out and that 
they are happy, that they're content. That's going to give us a lot of clues. But weighing is going to be your one sure way of knowing if your baby's gaining. Because if a baby only gains 200 grams in two weeks, for example, a mom's not going to see that necessarily. So how much well, are they gaining? Sorry, gaining in that period then? What, what's recommended? Yeah, there's not actually like a fixed amount, but we would say probably 180, anything between 180 grams and 300 grams a week is a good weight gain. Uh, what is more important is the milestone weight gain. So what I mean by that is for boys, we want boys to have doubled their birth weights by the time they're three months old. So if they're born at three kilos, we want them to be six kilos. Okay. And a little girl, we want them to have doubled their weight by three to four months. Okay. So that is really what is more important from a milestone point of view. But when it comes to knowing if the baby's nutritionally getting enough, weighing is quite important. So I would try and get your baby weight. Going to the peed is not necessary. Go to your local pharmacy. They usually have a clinic sister there, and you can quickly see someone and just have the baby weighed. Okay. And then part another two questions that I've see, I see here, that water – um, when should I give baby water, newborn? Should I be giving a newborn water or not? If a baby's being okay, <laughs> I'll be quick. If a baby's being formula fed, then absolutely you can give them some water, but not. I wouldn't recommend it in the first three months. The reason okay. for that is because they're getting water with the formula anyway. Okay, and the same goes for bre breast milk. No water. There is water in breast milk. Okay. And the reason why we don't recommend water is because water fills you. What do we say to people who are trying to lose weight? Have a glass or two of water before you eat. It'll fill you so you don't eat as much. The yeah. concept is the same yeah. for the baby. If you're filling them up with water, they're not going to eat properly. So the nutritional levels are not going to be met. Mm. And you're going to have possibly a fussy baby or, worst case scenario, you're going to have a baby that's actually not thriving. So water is not really recommended in the, in the first three months. Second last question, nappy rash. Yes. How to deal with, with nappy rash? Because I know right now, well, for the research that I've done and what has helped me was, you know, castor oil or zinc, you know, that has helped me. But how do you deal with nappy rash? Nappy rash is a very difficult one because obviously it depends what's causing it. A lot of the time it's an internal problem. It's actually not a skin issue. Um, moms who've got babies with reflux um, often have babies who have nappy rash. So if your baby's digestive system is under strain, it'll, it can be shown in a nappy. We also need to be careful because thrush can also show up as a nappy rash, okay? So yeah, yeah. you need to be aware of that. If nothing's working, my recommendation would be to either go and see your clinic sister or to get you – you don't need to go to your ped. Your GP is fine. But first try very natural things like, uh, look, a pseudo cream is a fantastic <clears throat> product. Um, but yeah. using a cream, yeah. we, what we recommend initially when baby's born is Vaseline. But because it's a barrier, and especially we were talking about meconium, it's easier to get off. But later yeah. on, you want to put a cream. Okay. Pseudo cream helps tremendously with nappy rashes. But if it's a severe case, you've got to ask yourself, is this an internal issue or just a skin problem? Right. And from the moms might have to decide. Some of the pharmacies have got fantastic little um, cocktails that they've made themselves that can help that have got zinc. Zinc is fantastic. You do get zinc creams. But mm -hmm. if all else fails, my oldest son had a rash once and he was walking already, that it was like crusting. It was so bad. The sport child. We used to let him walk around without a nappy because otherwise, you know, it felt like it wasn't getting better. And I eventually yeah. had to yeah. take him to the doctor. And sometimes it needs a cortisone or steroid cream, you know, mm -hmm. so it depends on the severity. But have a look at if your baby showing signs of reflux. If they are, that could be the reason. In other words, how, does their breath smell funny? Are they um, vomiting or positing more than they normally do? Do they seem uncomfortable at feeds? Because if it's sore here, it's going to go right through the, the, the uh, digestive tract and it's going to end up in the bum, shame, poor little things. Last question before I let you go. This has been so insightful. We actually need another one because I'm I telling you. <laughs> <more> questions. <laughs> um, 
Um, and I'm seeing a lot of questions here about twins because we don't talk much about twins. And I see that a lot of mm. mommies think, you know, I'm expecting twins. How can I prepare? And, you know, breastfeeding for twins. But the last question is, what's the single most important thing I can do for my newborn or newborns if I've got twins, you know, bonding? What, what's the most important thing as a new mom, as a new dad that I can do for my newborn? I would say two things. First of all, I would say skin to skin. Mm. That's absolutely vital. doesn't matter if it's winter or summer. Skin to skin, do some research about skin to skin or kangaroo mother care, as it's also known. And I'm telling you now, the benefits of skin to skin is just phenomenal. So that's one thing I would recommend. And I'm talking about once you get home as well. It's not just in hospital. I'm talking about the first six to eight weeks at least. And even carrying your baby with you if you're busy with stuff around the house. So skin to skin is very important. And if you would like to breastfeed, and if you choose to breastfeed, get help. Don't think because you cannot latch your baby or that you feel that you don't have enough milk or your baby's fussy all the time that it's the end of the road. No, it's not. Get yourself assistance. There are so many people out there that can help you. Doulas, lactation consultants, all sorts of people out there that can help. And don't go to the doctor because the doctor will often put you, get you to put your baby onto formula. Get people that are passionate about breastfeeding. You can tell I'm getting passionate. <laughs> <laughs> who are passionate about breastfeeding and who understand breastfeeding to actually assist you. Because given the right help, I would say 90% of moms, if not more, can have a successful breastfeeding relationship. So those would be my two biggest things I would say to moms. Donna, thank you so much. We're out of time. Um, you must want to get a hold of you when, if people want to ask more questions or need more tips. Okay, so obviously on my Instagram page, Donna underscore the underscore Dula. Dula, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking about it in my head. <laughs> I also have a Facebook page, Donna the Dula. Okay. And um, Dula spelled D O U L A, just for people who are not sure. Um, and on there, I post a lot of very interesting articles. They can also leave a message for me if they want me to get in touch with them privately. I can set up appointments with people. Um, my cell phone number's on there. Oh, not my cell phone number. Yes, my cell phone number and my email address are on there. They're very welcome to contact me if they have more questions. And I'm even happy to do online um, childbirth education classes, whatever is necessary, or postnatal uh, advice with moms, especially due to COVID, because obviously everybody's been more cautious now. So right. those All are right. probably the best ways for them to get hold of me. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank this you. And I'm sure another session will follow up when, when Mama Magic Team is ready. But thank you, yes, everyone. For joining. I enjoyed this. We will see you soon. And don't forget Mama Magic SA weekend. You know, lots of nice things happening on there. Register your baby and Congratulations, mom to bees. <laughs> Bye. Yes. Bye bye. Cheers.